In order to understand Fulgentius of Rusp and his labors for the gospel, we need some geographical, historical, and theological background. Now this is a map of the Roman Empire at its height, the red part. Near the middle is the Mediterranean Sea. To the north we have Europe, of course. Over here, Western Asia. And down here, North Africa. This is the world of the early Christian church. Our Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man in one divine person forever, he was born in Bethlehem, in this part of the world, brought up in Nazareth, further north. His public ministry was mostly in Galilee and in Jerusalem, outside the gates of that city. He died on the cross for the salvation of all of his people, bearing away our sins on his body on the tree. On the third day, he rose again after his burial, and then he ascended up into heaven. The book of Acts, to move to the fifth book of the New Testament, tells us of the expansion of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to Galilee up to Phoenicia, then into what's now Turkey and Greece before Paul's journey to Rome, the capital of that mighty empire. And in the first few centuries, Christian churches were established throughout the whole of that Roman Empire and some even somewhat outside its boundaries. But then, in the 5th century, the Roman Empire, and by this now I mean the western half of the Roman Empire, it declined and it fell. A fall usually dated 476 AD. And then the Germanic tribes from the north swept in, taking over the western half of the empire, both in Europe over here and in North Africa. A little bit of history. I hope everybody's with me so far. Now we need to backtrack just a little before moving forward to introduce to you the heresy of Arianism, a 4th century Christological heresy, wrong views of Jesus Christ. Arianism was named after its protagonist, Arius, who was a presbyter from Alexandria in Egypt. According to Arianism, these are statements that they themselves made, there was a time, there was when the Son was not. He's not eternal. God created the Son first, before the rest of the creation, and then God used the Son to create the universe. And so Arianism denies the deity of Jesus Christ and also of the Holy Spirit, therefore. And so Arianism denies the Holy Trinity. And if Arianism sounds like a very strange heresy, it's basically the same thing as modern Unitarianism and what is taught by the JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses so-called, or the Russellites. Arianism was condemned by the first two ecumenical councils, Nicaea, 325, and Constantinople, 381, both of which were held in the western part of what is now Turkey. Arianism. Everybody got it straight. 
This brings us to the Vandals, with a capital V. The Vandals were a Germanic tribe, originally pagan, living in this section, along with other pagan Germanic tribes, north of the Roman, the old Roman Empire. These Vandals had been converted to Arianism, not Orthodox Trinitarian Christianity. Arian missionaries had gone north, and through their labors, the Vandals became Arians. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They denied the Trinity, that is, the only begotten, eternal Son of God. So these Vandals, being under pressure from the Huns, who'd moved in from the east, and seeing the weakness in the Roman Empire, they moved west and south until in 429 the Vandals crossed the Straits of Gibraltar into North Africa and carved out for themselves a kingdom. This kingdom included Tunisia here and Sardinia. So here you have in this map the kingdom of the Vandals who were aided by the Alans, and this is Tunisia in today's language, and that is the island of Sardinia. And you can see all the bits here in this pinkish color were governed by the Aryan Vandals. And it's these two parts, what's now Tunisia and Sicily, where Fulgentius of Rusp, the main man in today's lecture, where he lived almost all of his life. Now I've explained how the Vandals came to be both Arians and in the world of Fulgentius of Rusp. I want to add now that the Vandals differed from the other Aryan German tribes who had carved out kingdoms for themselves in the old western half of the Roman Empire, the Vandals differed from the other Germanic Aryan tribes in that, number one, they very actively sought to convert Orthodox Christians to Arianism. And number two, they weren't beyond using persecutions to put the pressure on the Orthodox Trinitarian Christians to make them into Arians, that is, to get them to deny the deity of Jesus Christ and the blessed truth of the Trinity. To say a little more about the places in the life of Fulgentius of Rusp, Thelepta, he was born in Thelepta, that's his birthplace. His bishopric is Rusp here. He was exiled twice to Cagliari or near Cagliari in southern Sardinia. And he stayed for about two years in Carthage, involved in debates with the Arian king Thrasamund. I should add that in the year 500 he made a brief visit also to the city of Rome. And at the end he died in the city of his bishopric, Ruspa. Now let's turn to the timeline. I think everyone should have a copy of the timeline of Fulgentius of Rusp. If you don't, they're sitting on that chair. Some of the dates on this timeline are disputed. And my reconstruction comes from various sources. Fabius, Claudius, Gordianus, Fulgentius, very grand sounding name. He was born into a wealthy noble family in Thelepta in West Central Tunisia. 
His father Claudius died not long after his son's birth. His mother directed his education, requiring him first to study Greek literature. And his biographer states that Fulgentius committed all of Homer to memory. So that's the Iliad and the Odyssey and more to memory. After mastering Greek literature, he turned to Latin literature. The roles of Fulgentius in young manhood are three. First, he was the manager of the family affairs. They had servants or slaves. Then he became a tax collector, like Matthew the disciple. And finally, he became a monk. Despite the protestations and tears of his mother, Mariana, he went off to the monastery without letting her know, and she came hammering on the door and saying, how could you do this to me? I've lost my husband. The church isn't caring for widows. They've taken my son away to be a monk. You may remember that it was Martin Luther's father who strongly objected to him becoming a monk because then he would never have grandchildren and father had lavished a fortune on his education wanting him to become a lawyer to support them all in their old age. Anyway, back with Fulgentius, in 507 he was ordained as Bishop of Rust. Back to the board again. Little coastal town, 30 kilometers north of Sfax in Tunisia. He was very reluctant to become a bishop. He tried to get out of it desperately. A bit like Moses and Jeremiah in the Bible, or like John Calvin and John Knox at the time of the Reformation. The next year, he and 60 other non-Aryan bishops from North Africa were expelled. They were sent into exile in Sardinia and as I said Fulgentius was in and around Cagliari Fulgentius by this stage is rising to the top ecclesiastically not because of pride but because of his evident abilities and the Arian Vandal King Thrasimund, who expelled these bishops so that they wouldn't spread Orthodox, Catholic, Trinitarian doctrine in his Arian country, he decided to bring back Fulgentius from Sardinia to Carthage, this major city in the north, in order for he himself to debate with them. And as he thought, you Catholic bishops, send me your best man, I'll debate him on the deity of Christ. I'll beat him. And this will induce other Trinitarians to become Arians. So he gave Fulgentius, the top man, all these hard questions. And Fulgentius wrote a book, an answer to 10 questions. The book was very impressive. So the king decided, no more written answers from you, Fulgentius. An oral debate So he gave him a series of hard questions, one after another, without allowing him to write them down or trying to bombard him with words so he'd even forget what he'd asked. Fulgentius was able to remember them and answer them very ably. And then he wrote another book, three books differing with King Thrasimund. Over against the Arians... Fulgentius taught the full deity of the Son, his eternal generation of the Father, and the filioque clause, that is, that the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. Fulgentius taught Orthodox Chalcedonian Christology that Jesus Christ is one divine person, in two natures, fully God and fully man. That God is impassible, 
cannot suffer, that is, and is triune. And this brings us to Fulgentius' second exile in Sardinia. Because the Arian king commanded him to go back to Cagliari because he's just too good. He feared the conversion of more of his people back to Orthodox Christian Trinitarianism. It is at this stage that we need to introduce to you the Scythian monks. The Scythian monks. The Scythian monks were from a place up around here called Tomi. Or if you want it easier to remember, T-O-M-I, just say Tommy. The Scythian monks were from the town of Tommy. And Tommy was just south of the mouths of the large river Danube in Scythia. That's why they're called Scythian monks. And this area is now Romania. So these monks were from what's now Romania. And you don't hear much, rightly or wrongly, about Romania in the Christian church and in Orthodox church theology or history. So these monks from Tommy in Scythia by the mouth of the Danube moved to Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Empire or the Byzantine Empire. And they had two major theological concerns. Doctrinally, they insisted upon Orthodox Christology over against the Nestorians. The Nestorians said that Jesus is two persons. The Orthodox view is that Jesus is two natures, God and man, but he is emphatically one person, the one person of the eternal Son of God. So they were concerned about errors in Christology. They were concerned also about errors in the field of grace or soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, over against the semi-Pelagians, especially a man, we'll hear more about him later, called Faustus of Rees, and Rees is the place in, in southern France, who wrote a book of grace. So these Scythian monks from Tommy, now in Constantinople, are wanting to set forth orthodox teaching regarding Christ and grace, are seeking support. So there they are in Constantinople, modern Turkey, in 519, and they're not getting the sort of support they want. So they travel to Rome to see if they'll get stronger support from the Bishop of Rome than they did from the Bishop or Emperor of Constantinople. And it's not exactly forthcoming. So what they do then is, looking support, they write letters to the Orthodox Trinitarian North African bishops in Sardinia. See what they do? They want support first from Constantinople, second from Rome, and now they're seeking support third from the Catholic, that is Orthodox Christian bishops of North Africa, currently expelled and residing in Sardinia. Now let's go back to the timeline, the Fulgentius timeline. Remember we said that 15, sorry, 517 to 523 or thereabouts, his second exile in Sardinia. Well, if you look down that little handout, you'll see there are pointers there or little triangles. And these little triangles point to what we may call the three R's, a variant of the three R's, so to speak. Fulgentius receiving, reading, and writing of theological works. The three R's for Fulgentius in his second captivity or exile in Sardinia. He's reading the semi-Pelagian book 
of grace by Faustus of Rees. He's writing on the forgiveness of sins. He's receiving this letter from the Scythian monks who are looking support in Christology and the doctrine of grace. And then he's writing to them his first letter. Then he's recalled because King Thrasamund dies in 523 and he comes back to Rusp. King Thrasamund's son, Helderic, was a Catholic, an Orthodox Trinitarian. And then back in Tunisia, in the Rusp area, he writes his second letter to the monks and he writes the truth about predestination and grace. These aren't the only things he wrote. These aren't even the only things he wrote in this period. But I've mentioned the works that are most relevant for the rest of this speech. And so after about nine or ten years back from his second exile in Sardinia, Fulgentius of Rusp died on the 1st of January, and they didn't linger around with dead bodies in those days. He was buried the next day on the 2nd of January, I think, after reading the various arguments, in the year 532. Now, if... History and geography isn't your thing and theology is your thing and scripture we're moving from the harder bit of the speech into the easy bit. If of course you struggle in theology and scripture as well as history and geography that's no reprieve for you. But we're going to move. This is the second half of the speech. We're into the theological teaching of this great man because now we have given you we have given you the backdrop explained his position in space and time so what was Fulgentius's doctrine of grace especially now as he was spurred on by his correspondence with these Scythian monks from the town of Tommy let's start with free will what is the opposite of free will by free will, I mean, as our Arminians always mean, the notion that man has it in him to trust in Jesus, to repent of his sins, and to be saved because of emotion of his soul. And maybe even they would say with a little bit of help from God, or maybe even a lot of help. But ultimately, the casting vote lies with man. What is the opposite then of free will? Well, the opposite of what is free is that which is in bondage. Martin Luther's great book, The Bondage of the Will Over Against Free Will. Or we could say the slavery of the will. This is emphatically what Fulgentius of Rusp taught. Now I should say here that there are a number of quotes, and the difficulty with a number of quotes that are long is that if you listen that, that's okay. If you read, that's okay. But if you try and do both and, and then I move forward, you might get lost. So if I move forward, move forward with me. Otherwise, you'll get more and more lost, okay? The one, writes Fulgentius, the one who commits sin is a slave of sin. And by, what's, by whatever someone has been overcome, by that also he has been made a slave. As sin reigns, a man does indeed have free choice. Yeah, the unbeliever makes all sorts of decisions. He makes them freely. But this is freedom without God, not freedom under God. That is, he is free, the unbeliever, he is free of righteousness, not free under grace. And therefore, he is free in the worst and most servile way. Our liberator himself, Jesus Christ, however, explains how one may become such that is free by saying, if the Son sets you free, you will be truly free. He's all out against free will. Man does not have free will. Man is instead totally depraved. For Fulgentius, faith is entirely the gift of God in its beginning continuance and perfection God determines who receives the gift of faith and the measure that each one of the recipients receives 
this Fulgentius, he's sounding good already. Let's move secondly to election. Quote number one. All those who have been predestined are thus called so that they may be justified. And they are thus justified so that they may be glorified by God. Romans 8.30 As a consequence, God predestined whom he pleased both to good works and to eternal rewards. He predestined them to a good life and predestined them to eternal life. He predestined them to faith and he predestined them to splendor. He predestined them to be adopted in this age, and he predestined them to be glorified in the kingdom. He predestined them by grace to be made brothers of the firstborn, and predestined them by grace to be made perfect as co-heirs of the same only begotten Son. He believes in election. Fulgentius is very strong on the fixed number of the elect. This is a key point which nails things down. This predestination remains eternally steadfast and steadfastly eternal. Not only in its arrangement of the works, but also in the number of persons it has chosen. Thus no one from the plenitude of that number will lose the grace of eternal salvation and no one who is not of that number will attain to the gift of eternal salvation. Since God knows all things before they come about, just as he is certain about the number of the predestined, so also there is no doubt about the outcome of works he has planned. That's election. What about reprobation now in his extant writings some of them are lost fulgentius does not deal with reprobation that much but here is one quote he refers in the language of romans 9 to the vessels of mercy which although they are from the same lump of sinners are freely made into vessels for honor they are set apart from the vessels of wrath, which were created for dishonor. Two types of people, two types of vessels. God forms and sets apart. This is all in accordance with the gift of free justification, as Blessed Paul says, What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, so that he might show riches? the riches of his glory in the vessels of mercy which he prepared for glory. You might be asking, if that's what he holds about free will, that's what he holds about election, and that's his view on reprobation, what does Fulgentius say about limited atonement or particular atonement? The first answer to that is that the extent of Christ's atonement, the issue for whom did Jesus shed his blood and make a propitiation, the extent of Christ's atonement wasn't really a part of the semi-Pelagian controversy through which Fulgentius lived. It wasn't an issue. It wasn't on the agenda. These are the words of Francis Gummerlock, who has an excellent book on Fulgentius, Fulgentius of Rust on the Saving Will of God. Gummerlock says, in a letter to Theodore, a prominent Roman senator, presumably written late in the second exile, Fulgentius wrote of Christ dying, quote, equally for all the faithful. Equally for all the faithful, not equally for all humanity, but equally for all the faithful. Without making too much of this incidental comment, they or it would be an indication that as Fulgentius views on the extent of the saving will of God narrowed from universality to particularism, his view of the extent of the atonement also narrowed. It would certainly not be inconsistent of Fulgentius if in his later writings he restricted the intended 
intended recipients of the atonement to the faithful. Some of you will remember a previous lecture on Gottschalk of Orbe in the 9th century. Gottschalk was a lot more explicit than Fulgentius some 400 years before and a lot more antithetical. He was crystal clear and forceful. Jesus died only for the elect. Fulgentius, not quite as clear. But then it wasn't part of the controversy in his day. What then about the remaining two points of Calvinism, to use that structure? What about the remaining two points of Calvinism, as they're known? That is, irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints, the fourth and fifth points. Well, Fulgentius of Rusp teaches both irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints, and he does this repeatedly and emphatically. You could say he was a Calvinist born out of due time. Should then this truth of God's sovereign grace in Jesus Christ be kept silent or hushed up, or perhaps maybe it should only be taught to some of God's children, the ones who are further along and are able to, to cope with it? Fulgentius says, no way. This must be taught publicly preached to the whole church. The Apostle Paul wanted the truth he wrote in his letters to be preached to all men. And he's dealing especially with predestination and related doctrines. Therefore, there is no doubt that whoever strives to refute or fight against the apostolic words denies the apostolic commands. For the blessed apostle preached predestination faithfully and truthfully, and in the same way he commanded that it be preached faithfully and truthfully to us, including himself. This ought to be preached to me, Fulgentius, and to you, and indeed preached to you by me. Now let's go further. For Fulgentius of Rusp, God is absolutely sovereign in salvation and in all of its elements. Election, regeneration, calling, the gift of faith, sanctification, preservation, all the way to glorification. But now the question is, is there a sense, is there a sense in which God also earnestly and passionately desires, wants, or wishes to save everybody? He believes in sovereign grace, but is there also a sense in which sort of God wants to save everybody? I think, I think we've got some fireworks going off for Halloween, but don't let it distract you. The action isn't up there, it's up there. That is, is there also for Fulgentius some sort of non-saving, some sort of resistible desire of God to serve the non-elect? That is, to put it slightly differently, is there a general universal wish of God to save the non-elect Teach a sovereign grace, but does he also teach this other resistible grace, a general will or desire of God to save everybody? That's the question now. And you know the texts that are used for this view. And I'll mention three of the main ones that Fulgentius refers to in his works. Matthew 23, verse 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thee? So it's often quoted, but you would not. Second Peter 3, verse 9, God is not willing that anybody should perish. That's the bit that's quoted. And 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, which says that God would have all men to be saved. And on the 
this slide, we have a long, and I personally will add the word sordid, a long and sordid history of the use of these three texts, and a few others, but chiefly these three, a long history of the use of these three texts in the history of the church, alleging a resistible and indeed always resisted general desire of God to save everybody. This was part and parcel of Pelagianism, a heresy in the early church, semi Pelagianism, another heresy, Roman Catholicism, a heretical system, Anabaptism, including the 16th century. Anabaptism of the Reformation. John Knox wrote about this view in his debate with an Anabaptist. Forms a large part of that work of his. Arminianism. The Arminians believed that God loved everybody and wanted to save everybody. And they were condemned, of course, at the Synod of Dort. The Amaraldians. A halfway house or compromise between Arminianism and the truth. Amaraldianism sprung up. And hypo-Calvinism. And hypo, think hypodermic needle, dermos skin, hypo under the skin. Hypo-Calvinism is under Calvinism. And these people say, we're Calvinists, but we believe that God also loves everybody and wants to save everybody. And the hypo-Calvinists did not agree with the Amaraldians, the Arminians, the Anabaptists, the Roman Catholics, the semi-Pelagians, and the Pelagians. There's also one name, not in our theological system, but one name of a theologian that I could have added at the bottom of that list, Fulgentius of Rusp himself. To be more precise, Fulgentius of Rusp himself in his early days, that is, until by God's grace and through further study, the early Fulgentius believed that God did generally and universally want to save all men. But then God taught him the truth. So what then does the mature Fulgentius say regarding these texts? First of all, Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Fulgentius, like Augustine before him, points out that the text is not saying that Christ desired to gather Jerusalem, and Jerusalem stopped him, Fulgentius rightly says, the text says that Christ willed to gather Jerusalem's children, but Jerusalem, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, did all that they could, and I think here it would be proper to say, did their damnedest to stop him. But God saved him anyway. Just like I've had it in this church where there's a father who didn't want his children catechized in the Reformed Church and his mother brought the children to me anyway. And I taught them the truth. He willed not, but God evidently willed that the children were taught their catechism. Here's Fulgentius. Our Savior reproves the malevolence of the unbelieving city. It's not, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, where he wants to save Jerusalem. It's a reproof. And he's reproving the malevolence, the bad will of the unbelieving city, represented by its teachers, the scribes and Pharisees, and Sadducees who were hypocrites, as Jesus continually says in Matthew 23. Our Savior reproves the malevolence of the unbelieving city in Matthew 23, verse 37, which he Fulgentius quotes there. Christ said this to show its evil will, by which it tried in vain to resist the invincible divine will, when God's good will neither could be conquered by those whom it deserts, nor could not be able to accomplish anything which it wanted. That Jerusalem, insofar as it attained to its will, did not wish its children to be gathered to the Savior, but still he gathered all whom he willed. In this, it, that is Jerusalem, wanted to resist the omnipotent, but was unable to, because God, who, as it is written, 
whatever the Lord pleases, he does, converts to himself whomever he wills. Good man, full changes. The second text appealed to in Fulgentius' day and by hypo-Calvinists today and by the Roman church to this current day and many others, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, and here's the only bit you really ever hear quoted, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all, and by that they mean every individual head for head, and Fulgentius does what everybody with any skill at reading the scriptures has always done. God is long suffering to usward the believers, those who are in Jesus Christ, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. And so God's will is such that none of us, the elect, perish, and that all of us are brought to repentance. Here's the third text. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. This is the number one text. In Fulgentius' day, the number one text. Before Fulgentius, after Fulgentius, and to this very day. This is the number one text cited all the way from the Pelagians to the hypo-Calvinists and Roman Catholics and Anabaptists of our own day, the number one text cited as if it proved that there is in God an ineffectual desire to save the majority of the human race. But in effect, actually, God has failed with most people who have ever or even are living right now. Fulgentius deals with 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, in several of his works and at great length, Page after page after page after page. And contrary to the exegesis which has here an ineffectual and failing will of God, Fulgentius says, first of all, this is absurd. This reading of the text is ridiculous. Number one, God, you say, you take the old to mean everybody head for head. God wants to save everybody and come to the knowledge of the truth. But number one, the majority of human beings, even by the year 2021, have probably never even heard the gospel. So God really wants to save everybody. He really wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. And they never even hear the gospel. What sort of a God is that? He's utterly pathetic. Secondly, the scripture teaches... That God, you you say that God wants to save everybody. Everybody, including the non-elect. But the scripture teaches that God actually hides the gospel even from many people who hear it so that they never get it into their heart. And in fact, that God hardens some people through the gospel. And yet you come up with this ridiculous idea that all here means everybody head for head. It just doesn't. And then he explains that the word all here means all kinds of men. Just like the previous verse refers. It talks about, it talks about the need of the church to pray for kings and for all sorts of people who are in authority. For God will have all kinds of men to be saved. Even persecutors. Even rich, powerful, wicked people. God saves all. All sorts of men, high and low, male and female, rich and poor, from every kindred, nation, tribe and tongue. And therefore we can pray for them that if God wills to save them, he'll convert them and give them a new heart. And when Fulgentius argues thus, he is emphatically not on his own. In fact, anybody in the history of the Christian church who is a really solid theologian agrees with Fulgentius. We have on our church website... A page entitled Quotes on 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 from all these worthies arranged in chronological order and if you go to that page and hit the print button it's 43 pages. And the good news is through my reading and actually my research more on Fulgentius and some of the people connected with him I have more to add and it will keep growing. 43 pages. Anyway, he is dead right. 
Because I tell you what, the next few verses go on to talk about Christ's atonement. And if anyone wants to make that all refer to everybody head for head, the context demands that they not be hypo-Calvinists, but they be Arminians. Because there it goes on to say, Christ gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due, due time. And if the all there means everybody head for head, then the all in the next couple of verses means everybody head for head, and then you're just an Arminian believing that Christ shed his blood for everybody, and that his blood failed, and it wasn't really a reconciliation, a redemption, a propitiation that turned away sin and brought us back into fellowship with God. It was only a potential thing that you have to add to or make effectual by the right use of your own free will. Now, having looked at these three texts, always the same texts that the Jesuits and the Amaraldians and the Arminians and the Semi-Pelagians appealed to, and Fulgentius's refutation of them, now let's come to Fulgentius's positive case for the truth that God's will and desire is always effectual. Fulgentius repeatedly uses two main theological arguments, both of which are intimately related. Number one, God is omnipotent. Augustine said that if you don't believe that God does everything that he plans and everything that he wants, you don't even believe the first line of the first Christian creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. You don't really believe in God's Almighty because creatures are able to stop him doing what he wants to do. That's not Almighty. You're not really even a Christian. Whew. God's omnipotence. That's number one. And secondly, the irresistibility of his will. Whatever God's will, whatever God wills or wishes or wants is irresistible. This is his high, orthodox, Christian view of God. Out of the many quotes that could have been chosen here or two, let us not imagine that the will of the omnipotent God either is not fulfilled or is in any way impeded in certain people. If God wants to save everybody but can't. For all whom God wishes to save are unquestionably saved. And they cannot be saved unless God wishes them to be saved. And each person whom God does not will to be saved is not saved. Since our God has done all things that he will. Therefore, all are saved whom he wishes to be saved. For this salvation is not born of the human will, but is supplied by God's good will. And again, the will of the omnipotent one must necessarily be fulfilled in all things. Therefore, whatever he has willed to happen, happens, and no one resists his will. For the power of God is not less than his will. There is nothing he wills to happen at any time that he does not do. The Lord has done all things that he willed in heaven and on earth, in the sea, and in all the deep places. Accordingly, everything he has willed to do in men, he does. He saves all those he wills to be saved. I hope you've all got that. Let's now turn to scripture texts to which Fulgentius effectively appeals. And there are loads of them. I'm not going to pick them all because it would take too long. Matthew 11, verse 25. Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. Jesus thanks God, the Lord of heaven and earth, because he hid these things from the wise and the prudent, which is what you would not do and what you certainly would not thank God for doing if there was in God any desire to save the wise and the prudent. But Jesus thanks the Father not only for hiding these things from the wise and the prudent, but on the other hand, according to election, revealing them unto babes. Matthew eleven twenty seven, another text to which Fulgentius appealed. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And that bit the Son will reveal him is the will there is not a future. It's wishes 
wants or desires. Nobody knows the Father except to whomsoever the Son wishes, wants or desires to reveal him. How much clearer can you get? Fulgentius appealed to this word of Jesus in Matthew 13 verse 11 and the parallel passages in Mark and Luke he also quotes. Jesus ex explains here with regard to his parables it is given unto you the disciples to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given. They don't understand the parables. God didn't give them this understanding. Fulgentius then says I thought you said God wanted to save everybody but he doesn't. Because he didn't give them understanding. John 5 verse 21. As the father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them. Even so the son quickens. Gives spiritual life. To whom he will. And will is in future. Will is wishes wants. The son quickens in regeneration or the new birth. He quickens whom he wills or wishes or wants. And then there's this text. The text from Psalm 135, which you may well have guessed when we sang it. Psalm 135, verse 6. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, whatever the Lord pleased, whatever he wanted, wished, desired to do, that he did. Whether it's in heaven, in the earth, in the sea, and even at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, in all deep places. And Fulgentius keeps quoting this verse. He says, your problem is you don't understand the will of God because the scripture says, whatever the Lord pleased, that he does. And you've got something that God wishes, wants, or and he doesn't do it. You're talking about a different God. And in quoting Psalm 135, verse 6, time and time again, Fulgentius is walking in the footsteps of Augustine before him and Gottschalk after him. I've quoted there just, just five of the many verses Fulgentius cites. But there's one chapter to which he turns time and time again in which he gives page after page of exegesis. The one chapter is as you would guess. Romans 9. Romans 9. We read it earlier. Jacob and Esau, before either of them were born, before either of them had done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of the God who calls. One was hated, and the other one was loved. Romans 9, verse 15. God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and, negatively, whom he will, wishes or wants, he hardens. So it's hardly as if God wants to save them when he actually wants to harden them. That's what the text says. Verse 19. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Who hath resisted his will? Fulgentius keeps citing that time and time again. Who is so God wants to save everybody. But Paul says, Who has resisted his will? He's trying to save everybody. He really wants. But who has resisted his will? Nobody. Your exegesis is completely wrong. Verse 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Verse 21, another text he quotes repeatedly, Hath not the potter power over the clay, so that he can use the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another unto dishonour? That's God's purpose in election and reprobation. And then Romans 9, 22 and 23. What if God, a rhetorical question, and he does too, this is the point, willing, wishing or wanting or desiring to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. We've looked at the geography and history of Fulgentius. We've placed him in the Mediterranean world of the 5th century. We've gone through his doctrines, predestination, 
no free will, irresistible grace. And then we've looked at this issue of what's called today the well-meant offer. Is there a desire of God to save everybody? A general will. And Fulgentius is crystal clear. My concluding section is the significance. What is the significance of Fulgentius on sovereign grace and now especially on God's irresistible saving will over against that other view. In general, think of the location. Fulgentius is an African Christian, an African theologian, and an African advocate of sovereign grace. We all love Africa. Along the same lines, we could say, that Fulgentius of Rusp, in his time in Sardinia, and this correspondence with the Scythian monks and his writing there and theological development, this could well be, and I say this especially to Ivan Ortu, who is from Sardinia, this could well be the most important theological development in two millennia that has ever taken place in Sardinia. And if you ever end up on holiday in Sardinia, you can go to Cagliar and say, Fulgentius of Rust was here, and there was a development of doctrine that took place here. Besides the location, I draw your attention to the time. We're dealing here with the 6th century. I don't know if any of you can tell me a, the name of a single Christian in the 6th century, a, a Christian leader or theologian or missionary, well, here's one. Into that massive void, that huge blank, which is the 6th century in your Christian church history knowledge, put Fulgentius of Rosp. And now we go further. This man who taught God's effectual saving desire, predestination, Calvinism, if you will, and the absolute sovereignty of God, without any will of God being resisted or broken or any desires frustrated. Fulgentius of Rusp, in holding this, is the greatest North African theologian since Augustine. The greatest product of Africa, North Africa, and probably the whole of Africa, in 1,500 years. And he's on our side. We have him completely on our side. Fulgentius was, as John Rotel put it, the best theologian of his time. And he was probably the greatest theologian of the whole 6th century anywhere. And he's with us. To go further, Fulgentius' perspective on God's irresistible saving will, his perspective even is striking. Fulgentius treats God's invincible will as an integral component in the truth of predestination. Remember one of the books is called, that he wrote, The Truth About Predestination and Grace. Book three of the three books in The Truth About Predestination and Grace is chiefly about predestination. And a large part of his specific treatment of predestination is God's will is always invincible. And 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 does emphatically not mean what those rotten semi-Pelagians pervert it and think it means. It's an integral, if he's dealing with predestination, he says God's will is invincible. Moreover, Fulgentius believes that this truth, the sovereign saving will of God, is very important. He uses strong and stirring words on predestination and God's effectual saving will. And immediately after he concludes that section, he moves to deal with the origin of the human soul. We know where we get our human bodies from, from our parents through natural generation. But what about the human soul? And historically there have been two views within Christendom. One is creationism, that God creates a soul at the point of conception. The other one is traducianism, that somehow or other the soul of the individual comes through the generative process. 
And Fulgentius, he says, you know, look, I'm going to say a few things about this. What we can say, what we can't say, what's going to be said on this side and the other side, who's for it, who's against it, that sort of thing. But it's not really that important. It's not worth falling out over. But now predestination and the invincible saving will of God, now that is important. And to deny that is not apostolic, not Christian, and is false doctrine and heresy. To go further, Fulgentius saw this notion of an ineffectual desire of God to save everybody. He saw it as a key intrinsic element in semi-Pelagianism. That rotten system of theology which was ruining the early church against which Augustine fought almost up to his dying breath. It was there in Faustus of Rees' book on grace that stirred him up. And it was in semi-Pelagianism generally. And he said, if I'm going to attack and write against semi-Pelagianism, I have to deal with this. It's part of that system. Just as it's part of these systems, as we saw earlier, this ineffectual desire of God, it's right there in Pelagianism, a vital component. Vital component in semi-Pelagianism, in Roman Catholicism. You ought to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church for the well-meant offer. It is filled with it. God loves everybody. Everybody's in the image of God. God wants to save everybody. Christ died for everybody. Anabaptism, Arminianism, Amaraldianism, and Hypo-Calvinism. Part of the system. And then too, Fulgentius of Rust was a convert. That is, he used to believe and he used to teach the well-meant offer that God wanted to save everybody. But then God turned him around and he saw that was error and he wrote and taught against what he formerly believed. And even the various factors that God used to lead Fulgentius of Rusp to grow in this truth, they're instructive. First of all, persecution. He was sent off into exile from his, farm, from his native land. He was sent off into exile a second time for years. And it was in exile that, he, that God taught him this, and not suffering. Secondly, it was in part through the reading of a heretical book, Faustus of Rees' Book of Grace. He read the error, and it sharpened his thinking on sovereign grace. And he realized, you know, these guys have wanted to... Some of the things that I'm saying agrees with what these heretics are saying. And I have to re-examine this. This idea, if God really wants us, then God's... If God really wants to save everybody, his will isn't resistible then. Isn't irresistible. Well, then maybe other parts of God's will are resisted. Maybe God can predestinate somebody and, that, and then the person go lost. Maybe God can give them grace and then change his mind. And the person be lost. And that's not the right interpretation of these passages. This is the way it went too with Calvin in his debate with the Roman Catholic Pegasus, And we have Calvin's Calvinism as the fruit of that reflection. And there Calvin gives us his most developed and polemical teaching on sovereign grace. And there he's sharpest against any idea that God's will is resistible because he came into contact with the error. And he realized, I need to be sharper here and clear things up. Thirdly, in Fulgentius's conversion, we ought to note the role of Augustine. Augustine was Fulgentius's number one resource outside Scripture. He is the most appealed to theologian in his writings. Faustus of Rees says this. He's appealing to those verses. Hmm, I wonder what. And he reads Augustine, and Augustine explains. Matthew 23, verse 3. Ah, oh, that's the right view. I didn't understand the difference between Jerusalem and Jerusalem's children. God is not willing that any of us should perish. Yes. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And fourth, we should mention the role of these Scythian monks. They wrote Fulgentius a letter about some pretty hard theological issues. And they said, how do we deal with Fulgentius of Rusp? They asked for a response. They prodded him onwards, as it were. So he went deeper and became clearer and more accurate. And theological development often happens like this, as some of us know, a time of hardship. 
you're coming into contact with heretical views and you have to think a bit deeper. You read some really solid, deep theologians and maybe there's somebody there like the Scythian monks to give you a prod and to push you onwards. But there's more to his significance. Fulgentius' role is heightened in that there were 15 or so other bishops with him. And Fulgentius was their spokesman and their penman when he wrote in response to the Scythian monks. He was writing not just for himself, but on their behalf. And so the names of these other North African bishops are given in the correspondence. He was the leading theologian and the leading writer and his fellow bishops agreed with him in what he wrote on sovereign grace. Francis Gummerlock again. Fulgentius was actually functioning as patriarch of the church in North Africa. What he wrote was the thinking and agreed to by these bishops. He's acting like the patriarch, the lead churchman of the whole of North Africa. This is the North African church in the 6th century, teaching predestination and sovereign grace, including God's irresistible saving will, over against what's now called the well-meant offer, and which is touted to the skies as if it was pure Calvinism. And this leads us to the issue of theological lineage. You've heard of passing on the torch. It happens most especially with the Olympic torch, passing it on. It goes from this city to that city and so forth. Well, here, the passing on of the torch of sovereign grace without any ineffectual saving desire in God. In the first millennium after Christ, we have Augustine in the fifth century teaching this. And Augustine was the most influential theologian in his day. His sermons and writings went, they did the rounds. The most read author in that whole century. And his books were the most read books for the next thousand years. And he's teaching. And then, in the sixth century, the next century, here's Fulgentius, and he's using Augustine's writings extensively. And the, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the online version I consulted, refers to Fulgentius as, quote, the abbreviated Augustine. The torch goes from Augustine to Fulgentius. And then Gottschalk, in the, in the 9th century, his number one source is Augustine. And whenever he refers to Fulgentius of Rusp, he often calls him, quote, the blessed Fulgentius. As the blessed Fulgentius says. And then he quotes him. To go further. This brings up the provenance. Of the main theological opposition. To the well meant offer. Or a resistible will of God. The main theological opponents of that erroneous and false view of God. In the early church, they were in Africa. Augustine is in the land now called Algeria. Fulgentius, he's in Tunisia. And then, in the 9th century, we have Gottschalk in Germany and France, and Gottschalk's friends in various places in the Western Europe. In the 16th and 17th century, the provenance of the main theological opposition to the idea that God's will can be resisted, he wants to do various things, but he can't. In the 16th and 17th century, the main opposition to that whole notion was found in Switzerland. John Calvin in Calvin's Calvinism. Theodore Beza in his 1560 Confession. The formula Consensus Helvetica, the Latin word for Switzerland. A creed written in 1575 by the leading three Swiss Reformed theologians, Francis Turton, 
John Henry Heidegger and Luke Gernler. And in 1649, the Geneva Theses, written against amoralianism and especially that whole notion that God loves everybody and wants to save everybody. Switzerland. In the 19th century, the Netherlands was the main location for the theological opposition to this whole rotten idea. For instance, Simon van Velzen, a leader in the Afskiting, and Abraham Kuyper, a leader of the Doliancy, two 19th century Dutch Reformation movements. And then in the 20th century, Herman Hoeksema in the USA and the PRC. This is the main opposition. A whole host of people have it in various centuries, have it right. And I say this because now I want to work backwards. This truth of God's irresistible grace and will is not some American thing. Oh, it's just these Americans teach them. It's not just some Dutch thing. It's not just some Swiss thing. It's not just some thing of medieval Germans and French. If you actually want to know the provenance of the main theological opposition to this idea of an ineffectual will of God, you have to go back to Africa. Africa. Fulgentius in Tunisia and Augustine in Algeria. Africa. That's who you have to attack. And if you want to attack any appropriate, oh, it's the American, uh, Dutch thing. You'd have to say, actually, to be more accurate, it's an African thing. Tunisia. Algeria. One last point. You may be wondering, what does Fulgentius mean? Augustine, in the 5th century, his name, think August, means great and magnificent. By the grace of God, a great and magnificent teacher in the Christian church. Gottschalk, a previous lecture we had on him one year, Gottschalk means servant of God. And he was a confessor of the truth under house arrest for the truth of sovereign grace for some 20 years. Fulgentius means brilliant, shining, luminous. Think of our English word effulgent. And God used him to bring the light of his sovereign grace and irresistible saving will to North Africa, Tunisia, Sardinia, the, the Mediterranean world in his day and onwards. And now a little bit of brilliance, a little bit of spiritual shining, a little bit of doctrinal luminosity, I trust, in your heart too. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, help us, Lord, to understand and deal with so much information. And we pray, Lord God, that thou would teach us the truth by it. Humble ourselves before thee, that we may gain a greater appreciation of thy awesome majesty, that thou dost truly reign and prick our hearts too, that we're more and more grateful for a free, sovereign salvation a gracious choice of us miserable, wicked wretches before the foundation of the world, our inclusion in Jesus, and our salvation which is sure and steadfast. Forgive afresh our sins and the weakness of our faith and understanding. Quicken us and bless our remaining time together. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.